Hi everybody, it's Father Tony, and welcome back to Talk Gnosis. Uh, and joining me, as always, is the Reverend Mr. Jonathan Stewart. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Father Tony. Reverend Deacon, I keep forgetting. Reverend, Reverend Sub. Sub Reverend uh, Sub Deacon Jonathan. It's Stewart, too many things. So I'm just. It's a bit of a. Me. It's a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, uh, so uh, we have a uh, an interesting show. We're going to talk about some uh, ancient Gnostic scriptures. We're going to talk about Rome, uh, and we're going to talk about a lot of things. But also, content warning up front, we are going to be talking about rape. So if that's something that is an issue for you, then uh, we'll see you next time. Um, anyway, to help us discuss these topics, we have Dr. Celine Lilly and Dr. Celine Lilly is a uh, lecturer and an academic, and she's written a number of books. Here, let me pull them up. Um, uh, the, uh, the Rape of Eve, The Transformation of Roman Ideology in Three Early Christian Retellings of Genesis. Uh, spoiler alert, they're Gnostic. Um, and uh, Thunder oh, Perfect gosh. Mind, <laughs> a new translation. So, Dr. Lilly, thank you so much, and welcome to the show. Thank you all so much for having me. Okay, well, the first question I have... <laughs> which, which father already uh, um, uh, touched on, and disagreement is good, but the Nagamati <laughs> text, the specific three that you discuss in your book, The Rape of Eve. So sometimes they're called Gnostic, sometimes they're called Cephian, Ophite, Biblical Demiurgic text, Nostalgic Israel text, Barbello Gnostic. Um, that's, that's just the top seven and more. What, what, what do you call them and why? Um, so I call them... You know, well, and I, this is funny because this is kind of still a debate with me at this point, but almost at this point, I call them nothing because I'm not entirely sure what they are yet. There was a big push kind of with my group, the group of scholars that I work with um, and, uh, you know, Karen King, Michael Williams, you know, people will probably know these names who know anything about this, um, that really started to look at them more in the frame of... Um, the diversity of early Christianity. Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll say that. And, you know, at this point, a lot of these texts seem like they were, at least the beginnings of them are written in the early uh, second century to mid second century. And I don't even know if we can call Christianity a thing at this point. And then when you look at the texts, they actually seem more Jewish and maybe that like Jesus kind of gets added in later. So I'm not really sure what to call them. And I guess the thing that I that I want to say about this is we can call them Sethian, we can call them um, Barbalo, you know, Barbalo texts. We can call them um, uh, the demiurgical, um, and that's uh, uh, Michael Williams' kind of mouthful of a term um, that I can never quite remember what it is, which tells you something about what a mouthful <laughs> of a term it is. Um, that that what I started finding is the labels started pigeonholing the text in particular ways. And the categories ended up becoming the way that we um, interpreted, it, interpreted them. So when I kind of started this path, um, gosh, uh, my doctoral program maybe 10 plus years ago at this point, I kind of asked the question, what would it mean if we threw out all of these labels and got rid of kind of the bifurcation between the canon and the non-canon and started looking at the text individually and what might it be possible for, for us to see again? Um, and just because um, I like kind of giving um, uh, credit where credit is due, a lot of this thinking came from a scholar, Vincent Wimbush, who spent a lot of time... Um, thinking about the fact that the Bible has this 500 year independent interpretation through the legacy of um, African Americans in uh, the new world, shall we say, I'm using air quotes for those of you who are listening. <laughs> um, but, um, and, and what would it look like if we threw out um, kind of this history of white European interpretation and um, for at least a little bit of time and really looked at this independent interpretational tradition. And this really spurred the thought of what would it look like if we threw out these categories and started to really try and find in as much as that's ever possible, coming to the text on our own terms with our own experience and seeing if we could see different both connections, disjunctures, both within, um, within between the canonical texts, Nag Hammadi texts, um, and the broader intersections of these things. So that's kind of a long answer to the question. So I'm not anti any of these categories per se, but I really am curious about 
the new kinds of questions we can ask if we don't use them as the lenses through which we're looking at the text to start with. Perfect. Um, <laughs> we love long answers. No, it's true. And, and uh, we ask that question of a lot of scholars because there really is still an awful lot of debate about, you know, what of what use even are these terms uh you know that that we use to describe them i mean at a certain point you need to call them something but yeah you know <laughs> what what that thing is and how we come to it is a is an interesting pursuit in and of itself i i feel like i just want to sneak in just really quickly with just a, a a a little thought around this and it's something that i've kind of been looking at in my own scholarship recently this actually totally speaks to my to my point about creativity in you know <laughs> these early jesus movements um that one of the things that i'm finding that's so interesting is that you know we have these little nuggets of the jesus story so you know whether people are using the teachings um the death and resurrection no matter what they are and they're really um bringing kind of this creativity to their own context and thinking about, you know, what does community mean? What does it mean to kind of um, live in our region during this time in these political circumstances and using the story and being so creative with it um, in ways that we couldn't really imagine? Uh, um, and to me, this is the exciting thing about this proliferation of the text from this time period is they're using these little nuggets. They're getting so, so creative about them. And I always ask this question, what, what would it look like if instead of looking at the text as some kind of um, prescriptive way to live, if instead we looked at their creativity and used that as the thing that we were supposed to be playing with today using these little nuggets of the story? Yeah, um, as uh, as Miguel Connor likes to say, you know, they're they're writing their own gospels and living their own myths, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. It, you know, the the interpretation, the the fan fictionization of Old Testament stories of of creation stories specifically, because the Gnostics, of course, were obsessed with creation stories, um, or the group that we <laughs> have come to call the Gnostics. I'll try and be good. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, we can have room for all of it here. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the specific text. Uh, in your book, you focused on the secret revelation of John, the hypostasis of the archons, and the origin of the world. Is that correct? Those three texts? That's correct. Yeah. So um, mm -hmm. as we uh, as we talk about those, I was listening to an interview with you just a little while ago, actually, that, um, and the interviewer said, hey, can you just in a minute recap the... Uh, the story of the secret revelation of John. And I laughed out loud. I'm like, yeah, just a yeah. minute. It's fine. That's all you need. Uh, <laughs> but um, I think some of our audience or most of our audience will be fairly familiar with those stories. And if not, they know how to find them. Um, but um, when um, we created in the last week or two, a new Facebook group for our fans, it's called the Gnostic elite. So if uh, you know, if you're out there listening or watching and you haven't joined just Facebook uh, search for that, um, and a listener, a couple of listeners, actually, a lot of them have been asking about the Demiurge uh, lately. Can you talk a little bit about the figure of the Demiurge in these texts? Um, Yaldabaoth, is he, a, is he the god of the Old Testament? Is he a, a lesser creator deity? Um, you know, what's, what's your take on that? So, um, you know, and again, I... Uh... Who knows, this will be one theory of many. But my <laughs> hunch at this point is that, so, um, you know, the text, all three of the texts, which is really interesting, um, there are these really odd moments where they switch back and forth between if it's, um, you know, the big true God of the universe and this creator God. And so I started getting curious about, like, why is the story switching in these weird ways back and forth in these places? And... Um, so I guess I'll keep going on this vein and then I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit. But um, so one of the things that I started looking at was, um, you know, what's going on in the Hebrew Bible? And we get these two names of God there, um, uh, Elohim and Yahweh. And what ends up happening is in the Greek, they get translated into theos for God, which um, corresponds with Elohim. And uh, Yahweh gets connected with Kurios which is um, the word for Lord. It's also the word in Greek that they use for emperor. And I started wondering about, you know, are these folks um, 
really using midrashic techniques um, and playing with these spaces in between the two creation narratives that we get in um, in the in in the first several chapters of Genesis. And a lot of a lot of folks looking at them in the scholarly realm have really associated this with um, platonic interpretations and the ideal realm and the lower realm. And I don't think that that this this proposal that I'm making, I don't think that it throws that out. I, but I think this is a really complicated way of kind of using these plat platonic ideals and looking at midrashic techniques al along with these two stories to um, to play with what's going on in this in this part of the Hebrew Bible. The interesting thing is um, in several of the texts when uh, Yelda Boeth kind of claims, um, you know, I am God and no other exists beside me, which we find in Isaiah um, and in some other places. Uh, they, the voice from the divine realm, usually the female voice, kind of says, you are wrong, Samael. And interestingly, Samael, it seems, um, and scholars much brighter than I am are the ones who tracked this down, seems to be the name of the angel of Rome. Okay. So... So this is like, so this to me was kind of like a no brainer of like, what if we're really supposed to read this allegorically in this way around these Roman emperors who are also called Corios, who claim to be gods, who claim to be saviors of the world, who claim to have created the known world in their image. Um, and what if this was a major part of the story? And I don't ever want to... Um, to throw out totally the spiritual baby with the bathwater, um, so to say, uh, that, you know, so many of, if we look at um, a lot of the um, ancient uh, Jewish texts from this time period as well, you get this idea of having the angels that are fighting in heaven that um, that correspond to the nations on the earth, which is why then Samael is equated with um, the angel of Rome. But but what if we're really supposed to, you know, as in the ancient world, politics and religiosity are not two separate things. They're part and parcel um, of one another and interwoven with one another. And what, what might it mean instead of saying, you know, instead of saying this, this horrible material world where these divine sparks are trapped, what if this was, was about the Roman emperors in particular ways? And what if one of the ways to look at Yaldabaoth is this idea of an arrogant ruler god who entraps people through the structures of the political system and what does that do and and still asking this question what does that do to us spiritually what might be going on with this and how might it change the ways in which we look at what's going on the text if we don't bifurcate um the religious and the political, the material and, mis and um, the material and spiritual, but really look at the very complicated ways that these these um, aspects of human life are woven together, really in the human person, in who we get Adam and Eve in these particular texts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, these um, these ideas thrive uh, when empires are dying. That's what, you know the thing that we've been saying a lot lately, and um, the. Uh, the the proliferation of these stories of being of feeling trapped of you know of uh, uh, the world not being as it should be um, you know the, we're seeing these stories pop up again and again and we saw them you know two thousand ish years ago when when these stories were being written in the uh, the last days of the Roman Empire so so we're kind of talking about how the, how the, the figure of the demiurge is evil ruler that is that rules the world traps people here that that is is a parody and a critique of of the roman empire the roman emperor so part of your your book sees this as well is that is that the text specifically critique roman myths and attitudes towards rape and sexual violence but I, but i guess before we can get into that we need to know a bit of the background of what are some of these Roman stories and narratives and ideas about rape and sex? So, yeah, so, so one of the really interesting things, um, and I also want to say, you know, Karen King was really at the forefront of starting to kind of make some of these connections around 
um, around looking at the Roman emperors and looking at particularly secret revelation of John in um, some ways as parody. So I just, you know, I want to make sure that the, the people whose scholarship I, I, d I rely on are, are acknowledged. Um, but one of the places, and I was at Union Theological Seminary with Brigitte Call and Davina Lopez was um, a doctoral student when I was there and working actually in um, looking at at the letters of Paul, particularly Galatians, and a bunch of these Roman founding narratives. And they're all, you know, for the most part, they're all rape narratives. Um, you start with uh, Rhea Silvia, who is the mother of Romulus and Remus, uh, who are the founders of Rome. And in the story, she is um, raped by Mars, or possibly by her uncle, um, as, some, um, as some of the stories tell. Uh, and this is how this is how Romulus and Remus were born. And of course, she is totally demonized for this. She's a vestal virgin. Um, they need to uh, maintain their virginity basically in the ancient world throughout in in the Ro ancient Roman world throughout their childbearing years. Um, she was given this as an honor um, by her uncle because that he didn't want her to bear any heirs that might be able to compete with him later. Um, so they aren't sure if he concocts a plot to actually um, violate her himself himself or if you know it's the story because it's Romulus and Remus that of course they need to be born um, through a god uh, because that's how founders are born and um, and um, and she's really she's she's thrown in jail in one story she's killed um, Ovid actually the poet Ovid the Augustan poet Ovid tells the story that the Aeneo River actually seduces her and she's so distraught because um, not only because of what happened, but the ways in which she's been shamed that she actually commits suicide by jumping in the river. Um, so it's, I mean, these horrible stories, and you can see already the ambivalence that's happening as folks are retelling them that, oh, we feel a little bit uneasy about, about these stories of sexual violence. So this is kind of the first one. Um, in the midst of this, um, in between, uh, Romulus ends up killing his brother Remus to become the sole ruler of Rome. Um, for any of you who, who have been to Rome, by the way, um, on the corners all over the place, you see the she-wolf suckling the two babies. Um, and the she-wolf, uh, the name for wolf is Lupa, um, which is also the word for prostitute in Latin. So there are all of these connections with women and sexuality already as we kind of start out the story. And um, then we get to um, the rape of the uh, Sabine or uh, Sabine women. And um, the problem here is that Rome, the Romans don't have any, uh, they're, they're, a, they're a community totally of men, um, of rabble rousing men, of criminals. They have come together on the Palatine Hill and uh, um, they realize that without women, they can't have any kids. Um, and within a generation or so, they're gonna die off. So they go to their neighbors and um, and you know try and try and ask for their daughters and women, and uh, both because so that they can get women, but also because through intermarriage, this is a way to create alliances in the ancient world. And uh, the leaders of these these neighboring uh, cities are like, "You've got to be kidding us! You guys are you know you're terrible people. Um, you're criminals. Why would we give our daughters to you?" And Romulus, of course, gets mad at this slight, and so he concocts a plan um, that they're going to throw these games and invite all the neighbors under the guise of hospitality, and then he's going to give a signal, and they're going to carry off all the women. So they come, the neighbors are being fed, they're watching these games, Romulus gives the signal, and, um, and they steal the women. And one of the most interesting things to me about this story is that... Um, we still actually perform a memory of this story today, um, and the ancient texts all talk about this, when we carry women over the threshold after marriage. And this wow. story actually comes from this story of the stealing of these women, because the women would not go into the Roman men's homes of their own accord, so they needed, needed to be carried over the thresholds. And that was just shocking to me, that in this ritual that so many people still commemorate is this memory of rape. And I was like, this is a big... This is a big deal kind of looking at this. Um, so eventually, um, this is also the story, um, the first Roman triumph happens here as uh, the Romans continue, uh, the fathers start uh, coming in to fight the Romans to get their daughters back. They lose in every case um, in something that sounds um, 
kind of similar in certain ways to, I, I wonder, are these the seeds of where settler colonialism um, was found that the Romans actually take the lands, the Romans settle those lands, and the peoples come back to Rome as slaves, um, and then are paraded through the streets as part of the triumph. Um, and uh, and um, and there you have it. Finally, the Sabines, uh, uh, the Sabines come and um, and try and fight for their women. And the women actually go out onto the battlefield with their children and beg their husbands not to make them, uh, <clears throat> their husbands not to make them orphans and their fathers not to make them widows. And there's kind of a, a peace that's formed, but it's really Romulus who's in charge. Um, so then that's kind of the next story. And then we fast forward many, many years to the stories of Lucretia and Virginia. Let me see if I can tell these really fast. Lucretia was kind of this, um, uh, she was a, the wife of a Roman soldier, and they're waiting kind of uh, for this battle to occur, and they're debating about whose wife is the most virtuous. And um, they say, oh, my wife Lucretia is the most virtuous. They go and see all the wives. Most of the wives are um, dining, partying with their friends, and Lucretia is spinning wool. And um, one of the son of the king gets infatuated with her and actually sneaks back later um, uh, basically to rape her and says, you know, if you will not submit to me, um, I'm going to rape you anyway. And then I'm going to kill one of your slaves and put him next to you so that you're um, so that you'll be shamed, basically. Um, what ends up happening is um, she she calls her father and calls her husband tell, and tells them to bring two friends, tells them what's happened. They basically say, you know, um, it's the they say it's the mind that sins and not the body. Um, so, you know, you're basically off the hook for this. And she basically says, I do not want any unchaste woman to basically think it's OK um, to live with this shame um, in my name, to use my name for this. And she steals one of their swords and kills herself. Um, again, fast forward um, uh, hundreds of years, and Tertullian actually uses this story as a, a model for good Christian women to say, if you're violated, you should use Lucretia as your model and kill yourself rather than live in the shame of this. Um, so again, you know, again and again and again, the last story is Virginia, um, who's kind of paired Lu with Lucretia. Um, uh, one of the people, the uh, uh, magistrate in the city gets obsessed with her um, and basically ends up finding this way to manipulate a situation where, where she becomes his slave, basically. Her father, um, right before he's forced to kind of hand her over, brings her into the forum, steals a knife from the butcher and slaughters her, saying it's better to be dead than defiled. Um, so these are kind of the, the, these huge stories of very pivotal moments in Rome's founding that we have these stories of rape, near rape, sexual violence. And, um, and I started asking these questions about, um, you know, could this be what's happening in, this, in the story that we find in the middle, embedded in the middle of these other texts? Right, and, and just to clarify, and, and, and I, I think you did explain it very well, but these these are the foundational myths of Rome, and the, everybody, most all Romans would know them, and they'd be the equivalent of talking about Christopher Columbus or the the story of the War of Independence in the United States, right? Like these are the stories that the the culture is built on, the foundational myths. These are the story that stories that the culture is built on. Um, we find them particularly in Rome, which is interesting. We definitely find um, there's some of the only friezes of women depicted in um, in the Roman Forum in the Basilica Amelia. Um, what happens kind of further around the empire um, as um, the rape of the um, Sabines is traded on coins, so it's on the back of coins. So this is one place around the empire you'd see this image. Um, Mars and Rhea Silvia found on coins in different time periods. And um, rape narratives are also the ways in which um, this is how kind of Rome depicts itself in relationship to the nations it's conquered. Um, so you get the yeah. So you get that um, the emperor is the father of the fatherland. Um, he's also the Pontifex Maximus. So he's kind of the so he's the he's the high priest and the father of the father 
um, father of the fatherland and um, Rome kind of has all of this integrity of the virginal woman in particular ways the warrior virginal w- woman uh, figured as Roma um, and her depiction is seen throughout the empire and then you get these disheveled um, a lot of times um, crouching down conquered women depicted from um, modern day Spain to modern day um, Turkey and so these images are um of dejected nations personified as women, sometimes even um, almost raped women, sexually violated women, clearly dominated women. These are um, ubiquitous throughout the empire. So even if you're not reading these particular stories, people are seeing these images. Yes. So, uh, and of course, this is a huge question, the next one. It's basically asking you, hey, read your entire book to us. But, um, <laughs> but we'll do our best and we can break it down. But what are some of the specific ways, now that we have this, 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 this context, this background, what are some of the sp- specific ways these texts critique and offer alternatives to these Roman ideas of domination? So, so since we have this covered, if you don't mind, I actually have, and I'm going to... Um, because it's so concise, I actually have this little um, kind of composite that I've made of the three stories. I want to be super clear. There are elements of the three stories that don't cohere across the board, but nothing that's actually happening in this um, in this text isn't actually occurring in one of the three texts. So um, just to kind of put that out there. Um, but it's just about maybe three minutes long and we kind of start at the beginning and it hits all of these major points so I always like to tell people as I'm reading this story think about these manipulative rulers think about these questions of sexual violence think about the fact that marriage um kind of these first um these first ideas of marriage which becomes the microcosm for how conquest and the whole empire is figured so how marriage is in the household the the roman household really becomes this template for the empire as a whole so if we think about both the microcosm and the macrocosm how does this story kind of fit in so um so in the beginning um the divine realm existed in perfect perfection it was a realm of mutuality of concord a realm of harmony and then something happened. A rupture occurred, and from this rupture, the world we know was born. In charge of this world was the chief ruler, and this chief ruler thought he was God. In fact, he declared to all of his minions, those in his government, so to speak, I am God and no other exists besides me. His words reverberated throughout the cosmos, and a voice came from the divine realm disputing him, saying, You are wrong, Samael, which was one of the chief ruler's names. The chief ruler and his minions were both shaken by and jealous of this voice, of this power they could not control, a power which both usurped and demoted them. They decided that they needed to entrap, to control this power which was beyond them, so they decided to create a human to seduce it. They created Adam, and they huffed and they puffed, but they could not enliven him, so Adam remained still on the ground. The divine realm saw the ruler's helpless Adam, and wisdom, also called Sophia, decided to send down her daughter Life to help Adam so they together could overcome the rulers of the world. First, these divine women sent their breath to Adam, and with their breath he was given a soul, but he could not stand. So life, also called Eve, seeing Adam on the ground, said to him, Adam, live, arise from the ground. And Eve's word became a work, and Adam rose and opened his eyes. When he saw Eve, he said to her, you will be called mother of the living for you have given me life. The ruler saw Eve talking to Adam and became jealous of her power. And they made a plan saying, let us grab her and rape her so she can no longer return to the divine realm. The children she bears will then be subject to us. But let's not tell Adam for he isn't like us. Let's stupefy and teach him in his stupor that she came from his rib so that the woman might be subject to him and he may be lord over her. But Eve in her divinity knew their plot and laughed at the rulers. 
Eve stupefied them and she entered into and became the tree of knowledge, leaving her likeness like a shadow behind. Thinking the shadow was the true Eve, the rulers acted cruelly. They entered her and possessed her and raped her. They were wicked. They defiled her in abominable ways and they defiled the seal of her voice, which had declared they were not gods. This was the beginning of marital intercourse. But the rulers erred. They did not understand they had defiled their own body. The rulers then placed Adam and Eve in paradise and told them they could eat any tree in the garden, but if they ate from the tree of knowledge, they would die. Then the wisest of creatures, the serpent, a creature of the divine realm came to Eve and said, did they tell you not to eat from the tree of knowledge? Eve replied, he not only said, do not eat from it, but do not touch it or you will die. The serpent said to Eve, do not be afraid. In death, you will not die. But when you eat, your minds will become sober and you will know the difference that exists between evil humans and good. He said this to you in jealousy, so you wouldn't eat from it. Eve had confidence in these words, so she took some fruit from the tree into which the divine Eve went and became, and she gave some fruit to Adam, and he ate it too. Then their minds opened. When they ate, the light of knowledge enlightened them. When they became sober, they recognized each other and loved each other and knew that the rulers were like beasts and loathed them. And through their love and partnership, Eve birthed children who would become the saviors of humanity, delivering the people from the subjugation of the worldly rulers. <clears throat> so. Yeah, so no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we talk about the, um, the, the fact that these, um, these rulers, these governors, you know, or, or whatever you would want to call them, um, uh, have a, a kind of a vested interest in maintaining order and mm -hmm. the, specifically an order that benefits them. Right. And so the way that they do this is to create these systems and put them in place to oppress the humans, you know, Adam and Eve, and then seeing that that's going to go awry, take an additional step of raping Eve in order to uh, defile her. So she can't go back. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what analogy is that in the, um, in the kind of Roman system of governance? So, so the part that I really, um, that, and, and I should probably just say to folks too, you know, most of these, a lot of this is direct quotes from the text. These are from my own translations of it. I work in the Coptic. Um, I'm a stickler about translating all my own stuff. Um, the word government actually shows up in On the Origin of the World. Um, I didn't make that up. That's actually in there where he talks about his minions as kind of being like his government. Um, and the thing that I actually think is so interesting is more this idea that, um, that, um, women become subject to men as human beings are subject to the rulers. So you have this microcosm and this macrocosm there. And the way that we're going to enact this power is kind of through the rape and through this containment and through this control. And, and I wonder, you know, I think there are probably, and I love this about these kind of texts, is that there are all kinds of ways to read this, is what does it mean that she can't, that she can't go up to her that she can't ascend to her divinity again. What does this mean? But I think the text gets a lot more complicated. And one of the things that I think is so interesting about it is, you know, when we talk about, um, you know, modern trauma theory, and I don't know how much we can map onto the ancient world in, in particular ways, but I do think it's really interesting whether we're looking at trauma theory. And um, I always then want to go to thinking about um, post-colonial theory, because I think, um, again, it's really dangerous, the bifurcation we get in the modern world around putting everything on the individual in terms of trauma and forgetting the structures that are part and parcel most of the time of how trauma manifests um, in, contem in contemporary society, um, in all kinds of different situations. But um, that she, she, she somehow in the midst of this violence 
something knows what's going on and she splits off into the tree of knowledge. So it's interesting that this piece of her that's supposedly not supposed to go to the divine realm has already split off and is safe in the tree before this rape even happens. So I kind of want to think about, you know, what is this possible? What's the possibility in this? No, thinking about that in contemporary trauma theory, we we talk about splitting and dissociation that occurs in in the face of violence. And then going forward, she ends up eating this fruit, this thing that was dissociated, ends up getting reintegrated symbolically through this eating. And this thing that was split off, Adam somehow gets brought into this healing moment too of understanding on some, I don't know what level we want to call it, but on some level that, um, that he needs to integrate this what was split off in the violence too. And that's actually where their partnership comes from. Um, so, so what's interesting to me is they don't want her to have this connection with the divine realm, but because, and even though she is split off, the serpent's from the divine realm and is still able to come to her. So despite the fact that they're trying to put these structures in place to hem in the humans, it doesn't actually work. Mm-hmm. So some some people see the uh, secret child as being ascetic and generally anti-sex, okay? And um, and and talking about some of the the parodies and critiques of the culture at the time, uh, uh, it also just sort of back up the anti-sex thing. Like in in the narrative you just read, it said that the 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 rape is the origin of marital sex. So mm-hmm. does this mean that you know? All, well, I guess all bad, all sex is bad then, right? Because for many ancient peoples or ancient Christians, that's the only place you could have sex would be marital sex. Yeah, no. So this is a really, I mean, so I think this is a really interesting question across the board. And I think, again, you know, how ascetic is the secret revelation of John? I think, I think, uh, you know, we can't totally know. And that is actually the one that talks about marital sex. That's. It is in that particular text that doesn't happen in the other two. Um, But it also says in this moment that this this violent act isn't actually part of the divine plan, this subjugation of of women in this particular way. So I also think that this is really interesting. And this is something also that Karen King talks about in her analysis of this. But, you know, Adam and Eve actually have some kind of, they love one another in the fullness of what that means in the ancient world, a lot of times being kind of a, um, a, a um, euphemism for sex. And she births Seth out of this. And Seth does have all of these connotations as being the one birthed from God. He's the replacement for Abel in the Hebrew Bible. Um, there are all kinds of interesting things of why Seth gets put in this position um, as kind of one of the saviors. But um but but they but the text is you know it says they love they love one another and Seth comes from this love and um, biologically there's nothing about a vir- I mean it doesn't say anything about a virgin birth it doesn't say anything about this so I think we need to assume that there is kind of some there is some kind of sex here and it makes me wonder about how it's framing so again this is my question what type of marriage is it talking about because clearly they talk. Um, all over the place, both um, Secret Revelation of John has all of these um, proliferations in the divine realm. And all of those proliferations happen through partnership, that you get a male and a female pair, um, really heteronormative, but this is what happens, male and a female pair. And together they work in order to kind of proliferate the next realm that emanates from them. And so Adam and Eve um, end up reflecting this partnership of the divine realm where, where it is really called, I mean, it's really a, it really is a partnership and that's the words that they use. Um, Mm -hmm. So I just want, so again, you know, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. And I don't know if we can know, but there is something going on here where I do think the critique is around this violent type of partnership, how this relates to marriage in in particular ways, in contrast to the way that this text is envisioning how male and female relate to one another, what partnership means. Um, And Secret Revelation of John in particular as well picks up on a lot of 
themes using um, the themes of harmony and concord to talk about the divine realm. And these were values that particularly came out of the story of the Sabine women, concord, harmony. And so those particular words are actually all bound up with um, conquest, rape, marriage in the Roman system. So I, I think we need to ask bigger questions about this, um, more about what the relationship is maybe than, oh God, do they, you know, is sex okay? Are they libertine? Are they ascetic? Um, and I'm wondering if those aren't the right questions to ask yet. Yeah. Um, I think one, something else that might jump out to, to modern listeners is, is that reference to, to Eve's voice being the seal of her voice, her voice being taken away by the rulers after, after the rape. What's, what's your interpretation of that? So they, they definitely have, um, there are some other texts that talk about the seal of the voice. I'm not entirely sure, um, I've done some looking into this and I feel like I want to do more work in thinking about this on a larger scale um, to see what the see what the relationality is. Um, but one of the things that I that I think is really interesting is the fact that what's the voice that comes from the divine realm, the voice that says you are not gods. And I wonder again about the silencing that happens and um, we see that kind of in the ancient texts around women as well. And I love the piece. Um, so this is particularly, again, on the origin of the world. And um, when Eve tells Adam to arise, uh, the place where it says, and her word became a work, that is a direct translation from that text. And so her word really acts as the divine word as the divine word that we find in Genesis that calls certain pieces of the world into being. And um, so I wonder about, I, I really am wondering about what this is trying to say about um, women and their, um, their power to their power of creation and um, the fear that really exists around this um, both in the ancient world, um, I, you know, I, I don't think we can talk about what's going on in the ancient world um, and not maybe draw some modern parallels around um, around um, the policing of women's bodies and women's sexuality. But that's really about reproductive control in certain ways. And um, the debates look different today, but um, we still are having these these debates still rage today about um who gets to be in control of women's reproductive freedom? And um, and if women have a voice around this and are active participants in um, calling life into being, you know, of, of course we don't want them to speak. Of course we don't want them to be associated with anything bigger um, than just their mere humanness and their uh, and their um, ability to be vessels. <laughs> um. So I, so, you know, I think again, it's complicated and, um, and, you know, to go back to kind of this original question, this is one of the reasons why, um, for me, it's been so important to kind of throw, throw out, um, for at least the moment, some of, um, some of these, um, categories, because, um, I found that they were limiting how I think about the text. And so again, I'm trying to ask some different kinds of questions and these are questions I'm still kind of getting to. So if, if any of you all or anybody in your audience has great, um, has great ideas about this, uh, um, so I'd love to have a conversation. What, um, what do we know about marriage in the ancient world? I mean, it, I'm not a, a, an expert on that particular topic, but my understanding is that for, a large majority of human history, you know, people didn't marry for love per se. It was more of an economic arrangement. Uh, um, how does that relate to the, um, I guess, the marital sex described in Secret Revelation of John and the other texts? I mean, I guess as in all as in all cases, you know, things are always more complicated. We we don't know a ton about. I'm sure individual relationships uh, acted, you know, the individual relationships could be different depending on X, Y, and Z. Um, we definitely know that there were love relationships but because we get elegies about these. We get um, uh, romance stories. So this idea of romantic love is not unheard of, but it's, but you're, but it's not how really marriage works. And marriage is about economics. It's about consolidating political power in particular ways. Um, we do know that, um, you know, women's women's places are complicated too. Um, certain women um, 
really did have some kinds of freedoms in particular ways, um, did have some economic freedom, could um, could call for divorce in the ancient world. Um, it, the stories are always more complicated. But if we're looking at ideologies on the whole, so, you know, the big patternings of society, um, women were usable and, and they really were for for bringing heirs. And uh, during Augustus's reign, he, um, once he, be once he became the emperor after defeating Mark Antony, he passed a whole bunch of legislation, um, particularly for Roman citizens, um, around marriage, around adultery, and around the proliferation of children, and this real requirement for Roman women to have children. And um, again, uh, the Romans didn't abide by these across the board. Um, you know, we we wonder at times if 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 Augustus and his household actually adhered to them. Um, there are some major indications that they did not, on the whole, which caused uh, Augustus. Um, people gave Augustus a hard time around this uh, um, in certain ways that his his own household did not adhere um, to his own uh, marriage laws. Um, but the ideology really is women are usable and their property in particular ways, and they are. Um, vessels for bringing heirs, um, male heirs into um, into the world. Um, so um, the larger story about this is definitely one of subjugation, of usability, of um, of power over, of diminished um, diminished capacity. And but you know, again, I think at the same time, which um, despite despite ideologies. You know, I I think of the Sabine women who, um, who've had it to the point where they put their bodies and the bodies of their children on the line to stop, um, to stop the wars that are going on. And even though, um, when I imagine the scene, it's horrific. They're showing they show something of an agency, um, there that is also undeniable. So, um, so I think. Again, we see ideologies and we see the ways in which people bump up against them. And this is also ancient, whether it's in the text that we're looking at today or, um, you know, or these stories of uh, Rome's foundings. So these are uh, these are very dense texts, particularly in my opinion, uh, the, the Secret Revelation of John. It's uh, when you talk about intertextuality, it, there's just references to so many uh, other texts. Um, they're they're strange for a lot of modern readers. Um, kind of getting out of scholarship and, and into theology. Would would you say that these are relevant to the spiritual lives of Christians today? of uh, Christians of any stripe, or if you were really interested in, in these texts, working with them, praying with them, learning from them, would you, would you have to go join a, a Gnostic church? So I, I think that, I mean, that would certainly be one place that you can absolutely, that you could absolutely find, um, find ways to, you know, to work with these texts. I think, um, I think they are really dense. I mean, it took me years to get, to get into them. I remember reading, um, and again, you know, folks who really paved the way for the work, the work that I'm doing now. But I remember trying to read Robinson's um, Nagmati Library in English, where a lot of the words end up getting um, transliterated even instead of translated. And so you don't realize that like pleroma means fullness. And might it be, might it be pointing to something more esoteric? Yes. But what does it do when we actually have a word that we can translate these things into? So the first thing that I would suggest is like trying to find the best translation possible. I, a lot of times, if I'm looking for quick translations, will go, um, I think, um, uh, uh, oh my goodness. Um, Nakamati scriptures is a, is a good one pretty much to go, um, to go to, um, that's usually my go-to, but anything that's not transliterating a lot and ask someone about this because you can find better translations um, of things. Um, I, um, But I think, you know, what's really interesting is I've heard um, of scholars who do prison work and bringing these texts into prisons. And there is something that people, I think, do understand. There is a resonance with them that people, um, that people get about like, wait, some things, you know, what, what are these things that hemming, that are hemming me in? What does my liberation or freedom mean in the middle of this? Um, you know, how can we look at, um, 
like secret love revelation of John. It's framed as like Christ telling these stories. And um, how can we think about ongoing ways in which we, um, I always think of the UCC's slogan about, you know, God is still speaking. You know, if, if, if our spirituality is supposed to be living, um, there are all kinds of seeds, I think, in these texts that are really interesting that even if they don't become prescriptive ways in which we live, they give us things to think about that can deepen our spirituality, deepen the ways. Um, I'm a big, per, um, I'm a big believer in um, community interpretation. I think things get really dangerous when we think we can, we have the corner on knowledge and we can interpret things all on our own. And so, like getting together with groups of people, um, for me, has been a really fruitful way of engaging texts like this. And then I think about something even like. Um, and, you know, other scholars are talking about this. This isn't an area that I've done a lot of work in, but like looking at um, how the human body is put together in Secret Revelation of John and the ideas around this, that um, the the deities or the demons associated with these body parts are actually these ways of healing the body parts. And it's this really interesting kind of um, glimpse into what does bodily healing look like. Um, and I think there, um, the triple descent that happens at the end, like, what does it look like if we take like this imaginally as a way that we can have our own triple descents in a sense. I think there are all kinds of creative ways um, to use these texts for um, Christians, philosophers, uh, um, Gnostics, you know, uh, people of any kind of ilk. And I think anything that spurs our imagination and causes us to think, I actually think these texts are sometimes more fun um, because they make us have to think about things rather than assuming that, you know, the kingdom of God is among you, that we understand what in the world this saying means on some level. Getting things like that in the context of a gospel of Thomas or a gospel of Mary or embedded in um, I feel like we get pieces of being um, the kingless gener generation at the end of reality of the rulers or hypothesis of the archons. What does it mean then to kind of pull these out? I think there, yeah, I think there are interesting possibilities that we haven't even scratched the surface of yet. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and that's uh, so many of our uh, our interviews end like that. <laughs> There's a because thousand there things is. just with yeah. what you were speaking in that I'm like, oh, I'd sure like to talk about that for another seven hours. Um, yeah. We could probably triple descent. That's definitely something we could jaw about for a while. Uh, how are we doing for, for time, Father? Uh, we could do one more real quick one, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, here's, here's a quick and easy one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, do you see uh, any way that the text themes and teachings reflect on our present time? Yes. <laughs> I feel like I feel All like right, thanks. That was a great yes, show, everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exploring your own. Go talk about it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think, well, and I think these are perennial questions of um, one of the things that I, ha that I, that I didn't say earlier, but, you know, we find, and um, this is work out at, you know, Jonathan Z. Smith, um, is one of the people in particular that, that I think talks about this, but, you know, creation narratives get retold again and again and again, our origin narratives get retold, not really as a way to think about the past, but really as a way to situate where we are now. And, um, I think on that level too, you know, how, what are, what are we imagining where we came from now? But these big questions about, um, I think with me too, is a super obvious way that I wonder about, you know, what are the connections between what's going on um, now and then? And um, and what's the legacy of this? I always think about, um, you know, the Roman texts in particular until the 1960s, kind of with the, with the um, advent of more global consciousness. What are people reading? They're reading... Um, they're reading the classics. They're reading these Roman histories. And these are getting in, you know, in the brains and in the bodies of our leaders. And so I wonder about this really long legacy of how um, how these ancient texts really reflect the ways in which we've structured society, at least on deep, maybe unconscious levels, um, in interesting ways. And how do these other texts um, help us think about how society is structured? How What are the connections between... Um, structural violence, structural malice, and the things that we see in our everyday lives. What is freedom? What does it mean to live in ethical community with one another? How are we supposed to treat one another? How do we care for, you know, I love the garden scenes because I, for me, 
they remind me of our connection with, you know, it's an animal that's telling Eve what to do. It's the fruit from the tree that, that actually is the thing that heals Eve. What is our responsibility to the earth in this time of global environmental crisis? Um, just to kind of put a few seeds out there of thinking about the really creative ways that we can use these texts to help us think about, you know, what is right relationship? What is, you know, when they rape her, it says they don't realize that they were raping their own body. And I go back to, you know, I always think about Buddhism and inner being, like, what is this pointing to with the way in which the violence that they're perpetrating on Eve actually is coming back to them, onto them, that they don't realize that they're harming themselves in the midst of, of perpetuating this violence. Um, I just think, I think there are, um, hundreds and hundreds of modern day reflections that we can use with these and, um, and other texts. And, uh, maybe I'll just say, because I think it's so important, we so often give away our power as interpreters to experts. And I think to me, that's the other thing about being in communities and doing programs like this and the thing, the people that you all bring and the ways in which you two talk with one another, um, and with your wider constituency, um, that, um, we all bring really particular, amazing things in the reading of texts because our individual experience is, is unique. You could read this text for the first time and see 10,000 things that I would never be able to see because of the way my life has unfolded. And, um, so read them, play with them, um, do what the early Christians were doing and like have fun and, and ask really important questions about um, who we are in the world and, and what community is and how we can, um, which is my big thing, you know, how do we live in the service of life instead of dealing in death? Mm, very postmodern. I love it. Yeah, that's a great way to end. <laughs> All right. Well, a uh, little bit of uh, housekeeping here. So um, for those of you who would like to continue the conversation with us, uh, we hope that you will join us over on our new Facebook group called the Gnostic Elite. And, uh, you know, you can always, of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel or to the podcast if this is your first time listening. We don't usually push that a lot, but, uh, you know, you could do that. And you could, you know, find out when we have new shows and new topics on stuff you like. So go ahead. Give that a shot. And uh, if you're even more excited about what we're doing here, I hope you will consider subscribing to our Patreon to help us, uh, you know, support the shows and pay the bills and do all that stuff and be a part of it. We've just revamped the whole kind of reward system, so there's some interesting things, including a monthly chat that we're calling Drunk Gnosis, where we're going to uh, drink and talk about things that we're interested in. So, uh, you know, 21 plus, of course. You can, you can still talk with us, you just can't drink. It's very important. Um, so, uh, uh, please check that out patreon.com slash gnostic and uh so dr lily anything that you would like to plug uh where, where can people find you on the web where can they buy your book um you you can buy my book probably by ordering at your local independent bookstore which i always like to plug or on amazon um and um yeah and i guess the best place i mean you can you can find me in different places by uh by googling me um but I think probably the most interesting thing is I am on the road with the Jesus Seminar quite often. So if you go to www.westar.org, um, you can find some of the places that um, I'm speaking. And um, always I am bringing in um, these extra canonical texts along with the canon when I'm on the road with the Jesus Seminar. Um, so if you're interested in more of this stuff, uh, find me there. All right. Thanks yeah. so much to you all. This was just so fun. Thank oh, you. Oh, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, it was yeah. a real pleasure to have you, and we appreciate your insights and challenging us on our terms. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. All Thank right. And for everybody who is watching or listening along at home, we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. <laughs>